Yeah, thank you for the introduction. So this is actually a work uh, that well, dates back to my PhD time at EMPA, so I did this uh, sales myself. <laughs> um, um, thanks to the introduction from Matthias and also Ma well, the other Matthias, I don't have to explain the benefits of uh, LECs anymore here. Um, but I would, what I would like to stress again is uh, the operation principle. Well, mainly uh, this last point here, that you have this PIN junction that is inherently formed, and this uh, like determines your device performance, and it's important to, to find out how this uh, looks like. So the topic of uh, today's talk will be how can we determine this PIN structure and the emission zone and the doping profile um, over time in such a running device. Um, well, this is kind of well, easy or straightforward if you have uh, these lateral devices. So in the beginning of the LEC work, there were a lot of these uh, lateral devices. So you have a, a broad inter uh, electro distance of more than five micro, well, approximately up to one milli millimeter, it worked. And then you can kind of simply investigate where your emission zone is and where your uh, doped layers are and how your profile looks like by scanning uh, Kelvin probe microscopy. But this is obviously much more tricky if you have a sandwich type device, which is more uh, to the application side. So if you have a thickness of 100 to maybe 1000 nanometer, uh, it's much more difficult to find out how this looks like over time. So um, first, a few words to our system. So we use cyanine dyes, so they typically look like this. Uh, they are not as high performing as the super yellow, but this was not the, the main interest of this project. Uh, they have another, they have several other benefits, and these are important for this study. So for example, they have a slow relaxation, so we can turn them the LEC on, switch it off, and the relaxation is so slow that we have a kind of a steady state situation of ionic charge carriers, and we can probe them with certain experiments. The other benefit is that uh, they have quite a high photocurrent response, so they were initially used in solar cells, and in such a simple device stack, they have kind of really high IPC for a, for a single uh, layer. And this is really important, as you will see in the afterwards, to, to measure one of the techniques. Uh, furthermore, well, they are interesting because you can tune the emission wavelengths by just changing these conjugated chain lengths, and they are also really cheap because they are used in biology, biological imaging. <coughs> so um, first, I would like to show you how we determine the PIN structure. And well, this is really a simple assumption, but it, it works quite well. So imagine you have this PIN um, structure. You will have a really high doping density in the P and the N doped layers. So we, we will not probe this by uh, capacitance measurements. And as a function of time, you will have a sh shrinkage of this intrinsic region. And this just turns out to be easily measurable by an increase in capacitance over time. And if you use just a simple assumption, no gradient of doping, um, use the plate capacitor model, you get quite easily the intrinsic region with during operation time. So this was quite straightforward. A um, bit more complicated is how to find out where exactly our, our uh, intrinsic region lies within the, the layer. Um, the first thing, that you have to notice is that, uh, again, we have this high photocurrent response if we operate an, an LEC in a solar cell mode. So we shine light on it, and then due to this PIN junction, you have some charges that originate from, from the intrinsic region where you have charge separation and also the excitons are not quenched due to doping. So you have photocurrent that is or only coming from the intrinsic region. This you see experimentally. And now what we did is to compare this with the absorption that you have. Um, if you just look at the layer absorption or the, the part of the layer, this blue, within the full um, L or cyanine layer um, as a layer absorption. So you can see that when you 
vary this position, the absorption changes dramatically due to interference effects. So we did not only look at, uh, so you could now think of like matching this shape with one of these and then determine the position. Um, but we what we did instead is to also um, fabricate a semi-transparent device and then we shine also light in from the other side, from the, from the silver electrode. And then we have um, both experimental IPC. And this we also compare to simulation when we shine light from this side. And um, yeah, here you see the overlap between this experimental EQE measured from both sides, from, from ITO and from silver, compared to the simulated absorption for a, a certain width and position. And this is uh, as a function over time. So you have first uh, very thin doped layers, then the P doped layer grows into the center, and finally also the N doped layer starts to go a bit into the center, and uh, eventually you have some degradation already, and uh, yeah, it's getting much lower, the photocurrent, and, but still you have some quite wide, actually, uh, intrinsic layer in such sandwich type devices. So the question was now, um, how does this position, this PIN structure, relate to the emission zone? So uh, you could think of, yeah, the emission zone is exactly the, um, inside this PIN or in the inside the intrinsic layer of the, the PIN structure, but it's not necessarily like that. It could also be just a part of it or something like that. So that's why um, we also looked at the emission spectrum. This is a typical emission spectrum of such cyan analysis. You have these two peaks um, quite dominantly. And if you compare this with a simulation, you can just vary the position of such a delta emitter. And you see that the, especially the, the ratio between these two peaks changes. So um, actually, you can already determine if you would assume a delta emitter position somewhere and try to look at the ratio between these two peaks, you can already say, oh, if I would have a delta emitter, it would be at uh, 0.67, so then the, the fit fits best. However, then you don't know anything about the width of your emission zone. So we wanted also to look at the, the width of the emission zone. And how did we do that? So we measured angular um, spect spectral uh, information, um, and then compared this to optical electronic, or only optical simulations actually with CETFAS. Uh, the fitting algorithm is described in this paper, and this is actually the result. So we have here as a full line uh, the emission from zero to 70 degrees, and uh, as dashed lines we have um, the simulation. And you can see that it fits quite nicely. How does the emission zone look like like this? So we <laughs> you see it here uh, as a red line. So this is the fit we get. Um, out of this emission zone fitting. As a comparison, you also have the delta emission position, and also overlapped is this um, PIN structure that we determined from comparing EQE with um, ex simulated absorption measurements. So what is interesting is that the, the emission zone lies mostly within this intrinsic layer, as you would expect. Also, their widths are quite comparable, so this is really good because now in a future study you could say I can either do one or the other analysis and I will get reasonable results. They are, seem to be transferable. And yes, so now furthermore we can use this analysis to also give some predictions or how we could improve it, um, this device. And well, we see that with our thickness that was around 80 nanometers, we are already in the kind of the the, the highest part of, of the art coupled efficiency. Um, but what we could certainly improve is if we would manage somehow to shift this image position closer to the anode, actually clo similar to what uh, Matthias showed, um, we would get an improvement in, in art coupling efficiency. But this uh, was not tried or anything like that, just as an outlook. Okay. Um, as a further outlook, I do not want to explain it, but um, the missing part is still the how does the doping profile actually look like. And here uh, we did some collaboration with Andreas from Willius, and um, he 
managed to measure the Stark effect on, on such LECs and combining this information with uh, our measured capacitance transient due to this different relation of the capacitance to the voltage profile and with the Stark effect amplitude um, you can get some kind of a, an idea how it, how it looks like. So um, we see that it's actually more or less uh, yeah, like a more or less like a step function for early times, but then it really smears out over time. Um, but if you're interested, I would recommend uh, to look into the paper in detail. Okay, with this, I would like to thank uh, my people at people at EMPA that supported the work, uh, uh, Marcus and Kurt, who helped with development of the Fellows instrument or Angular. It was actually a previous fellows measure measurement tool, and also uh, my colleagues at Fluxim who helped with the analysis. Thank you. <laughs>